trying to prove the squeeze theorem, I wrote an abridged version of the statement right up here on my one whiteboard. And so let us read the statement of the squeeze theorem. If you would like to see the squeeze theorem and its proof, please go to page A42 in your textbook. If you have an older edition of the textbook, then I'm sure it's somewhere in the appendix or it could very well be in um, chapter two somewhere. So this is what the squeeze theorem says. It says if we have a function f of x less than or equal to a g of x, less than or equal to an h of x, for all x in an open interval containing the point a, except maybe possibly at a, this doesn't hold, doesn't matter, because limits don't care about at x equals a, right? And we have that the limit of f of x as x approaches a is equal to the limit of h of x as x approaches a, so you can call that L, then the limit of g of x is the same as x approaches a. So we want to prove this theorem. We know how to use it. We never proved it in class. The proof is actually an epsilon delta proof. But don't be discouraged. It flows really, really nicely. But to get you started, if it's an epsilon delta proof, then what's your first line? Hmm. Let epsilon be greater than zero. So let's start with that. So uh, ah. start with writing utensils ready. Then let epsilon be greater than zero. Since we are given that the limit as x approaches a of the lower bounding function f of x is equal to l, we are going to be able to translate this into the precise definition of a limit for this case. So since this is the case and epsilon is greater than zero given, then there is, I'm gonna move out of the way, I promise. There is a delta one greater than zero such that if zero is less than the absolute value of x minus a, which is less than delta one, by this holding, we can say the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. That's the statement of this limit existing and equaling l as x approaches a, but with the precision of the epsilon and delta. One more step is needed so that we can use this in determining the limit of g, and that is that we have to kind of change this to not have absolute values. And when you want to change an inequality that looks like this to not have absolute values, you do it like this. It's L minus epsilon is less than F of X is less than L plus epsilon. So now that we have this statement in this form, you'll see why later it's going to help us out. I'm going to just label it part one. And then we're going to clear the board and we're going to do the exact same argument. We're going to still have our epsilon greater than zero given and we're going to pull up a delta two greater than zero and we're going to work out the precise definition for the limit of h equaling l as x approaches a. So we're gonna do that. If you wanna work ahead, that would be awesome. Or skip ahead, whatever. I'm gonna leave this line to last because it's the most important right now. And, all right, now I am ready to join you. Happy with this, got it? Memorized or written down? Okay, bye-bye. So we have condition one that's gonna be helpful to us. We're gonna do exactly the same thing for that upper bounding function. We're gonna say since the limit as x approaches a of the h of x is also equal to l, there is a delta two, I'm gonna get out of the way soon, greater than zero, such that if zero is less than the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta two, that is going to give us that, I almost wrote f, but it's h of x minus l is less than epsilon. Same epsilon, different delta, because it's a different function. So as I said with that condition one on the bottom of the previous board, we have to do the same thing. We have to translate this into its non-absolute value version, which is, do it with me, l minus epsilon is less than h of x is less than l plus epsilon. Okay, and that's condition two. We're going to combine condition one and condition two to show 
that by the epsilon delta definition of a limit, g of x, which was the squeezed function in between f and h, also has limit l. And that's next, that's what we're going to do. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to define a delta to be equal to the minimum of delta 1 and delta 2. I know this is really symbol-y, but actually this will be very helpful for you in preparation for an epsilon delta proof as well, in case one of them shows up on the exam. So not a bad proof to go through. So if we let delta equal the minimum of this, then we can say if 0 is less than the absolute value of x minus a, which is less than delta, then, and you know, I feel like maybe mm, we'll just use the word then. It doesn't matter. It, you wouldn't lose marks or anything if you used an if-then symbol properly. It's just I'm kind of making a discussion. So then condition 1 and 2 are going to hold. And I'm glad I entered a room because this is a good point for you to continue on your own if you can. How do you use condition 1 and 2 to derive information about G, basically? So, we have x minus a less than delta, which means it is less than delta 1 and it is less than delta 2 by the way that we design delta. What could you conclude? Well, we'll see in a second. Or maybe less than that if you want to skip ahead. Alright. So, how do we use condition 1 and 2? So then we have condition 1 and 2 combined so that L minus epsilon is less than f of x. f of x is less than or equal to g of x by the supposition of the theorem, and that's less than or equal to h of x by the supposition of the theorem, and h of x is less than L minus plus plus epsilon, not L minus, L plus epsilon, and that's by condition 2. Now, if you just focus on this and g of x, and don't think much about what's happening to f and h, then we get that l minus epsilon is strictly less than g of x, <laughs> is strictly less than l plus epsilon. And this way of combining condition 1 and 2 gave us the exact way to write that the absolute value of g of x minus l is less than epsilon. In fact, you don't even need this line. This line and this line are equivalent. It's just that this is the more familiar way that we usually conclude uh, an epsilon delta proof. So either here or here is a good place to then say, well, this is what it means for the limit as x approaches a of g of x equal l. So we can say, therefore, the limit as x approaches a of g of x is equal to l. And we can conclude our proof there.